uh, I'm going to be talking about joint work with uh, Maya Gupta and Jan Pfeiffer uh, about our approach to optimizing very heavily constrained uh, problems. So I'll start out by saying what do we mean by heavily constrained problems? Uh, and basically they're problems with a very large number of constraints. Uh, to be more precise, we're considering the problem of uh, <coughs> trying to find a model that minimizes some uh, expected loss with respect to some unknown distribution, uh, plus a convex regularizer subject to a large number, M, of uh, convex constraints. Um, <coughs> the, the reason why we started looking at this was because we were using what's called lattice regression, uh, citations here at the bottom, which is a technique that, that enables us to uh, learn very uh, complex nonlinear models of uh, small numbers of features, um, and yet add constraints to impose certain properties on the function that we're learning. Uh, most commonly, this would be monotonicity, where we'd say, well, we want the function that we're learning to be monotonic in these features, monotonically increasing in some features, monotonically decreasing in others. And we would, we would constrain our model with a large number of linear inequality constraints on the parameters in order to guarantee that we get a model that, that satisfies the, the, the requirements that we have. Um, when we use ensembles of such models, we often wind up with hundreds of thousands of linear inequality constraints. Um, and because we have often, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of training examples, we're in sort of a regime where the number of constraints is comparable to the number of training examples. And as a result, we thought, well, maybe it would be nice if we had an algorithm that more or less treated constraints in the same way as we treat training examples. Um, and you can sort of think that intuitively you could imagine that you'll just pick a uh, example at random, or I'm sorry, pick a constraint at random, check if it's violated, and if it is, we'll push ourselves a little bit back towards the feasible region. And of course, we're not the first people to have thought of this, uh, but our, our eventual algorithm will sort of fall into this, this setting. So our starting point is what we call the full touch algorithm, which is basically the same thing as what Madhavi et al. did in their uh, 2012 NIPS paper. It's, it's slightly different, but it's extremely similar. Um, and basically what we do is we take our large number of constraints, our M constraints, these lowercase gi's, and we maximize over all of them to define this uppercase g. And then we say that we're going to constrain uppercase g to be less than or equal to zero. And clearly if uppercase g is less than or equal to zero, then all of the lowercase g's will be less than or equal to zero and vice versa. So this is completely equivalent to having a large number of separate constraints. And then we'll take this, um, this uppercase G and we'll add it times gamma into our objective as a penalty function. And this, this gamma looks like a Lagrange multiplier, uh, but we're not maximizing over it. It's a parameter to our algorithm. We're assuming that you're giving us a gamma which is large enough to guarantee that we'll converge to uh, a solution which is an optimal solution to our, the, the, the problem on the previous slide. And uh, one thing that we show is that if our losses are L Lipschitz and the Stochastic, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the subgradients of uppercase G have norm at least rho uh, along the boundary of the feasible region. Then any gamma larger than L over rho will suffice to give us a, uh, a, a problem here where the optima of this problem are exactly the optima of the problem on the previous slide. Um, in terms of the individual GIs, it's a good deal more complicated. Um, <coughs> basically because we have to consider not just the norms of the uh <coughs> of the gradients of the g's at the boundary, but also the, the angles at which they intersect. Um, as a rule of thumb, if you're just sort of looking for a sense of how large gamma might be, I think that gamma about square root of m um, is a reasonable thing to, to sort of just keep it in mind going forward. Uh, but depending on the particular constraints under consideration, it might be larger or it might be smaller. Since we've moved our constraints into the objective, you know, we, we have now an unconstrained problem. We can just use SGD to optimize it. Um, <coughs> the obvious way to do this, of course, is to choose a uh, x and y from our distribution, um, differentiate the loss, and that gives us a stochastic gradient of the first term, differentiate the regularizer to give us a gradient of the second term, and for the third term, we have to find the index that maximizes the uppercase g, that is to say we have to identify the most violated constraint, and then we differentiate that, and we, you know, add that into our stochastic gradient, we take a, we take a step in the opposite direction. Um, if we do this, then we'll find that our convergence rate, as expected, is gamma squared over epsilon squared. Um, I should say that I'm, I'm dropping a, a whole lot of terms here, things like, you know, Lipschitz constants and uh, the upper bounds on the gradient magnitudes and things like that. Uh, I'm just writing, whenever I talk about a convergence rate, I'm just going to write it in terms of gamma, um, which is the scale that we're applying to the, uh, to the constraints, m, which is the number of constraints, and epsilon, the desired suboptimality. Now, the the thing about this is that it's, it's nice that we're converging at a rate that doesn't depend on m, the number of constraints. Uh, <coughs> however, this is saying that we're going to require this many iterations to converge, and we can see on step three 
that we have to find the most violated constraint. Um, for certain highly structured constraint sets, we can probably do that relatively quickly, but in general, we'd have to check all M constraints in order to figure out which one is the most violated. So, uh, what if we just pretended that we couldn't do that, or that we didn't have to do that? What if, what if we just had a, a, an oracle that would tell us which constraint was the most violated? Then we, didn't have to, we wouldn't have to worry about searching over all M constraints to find the most violated. We'd just go straight there, we differentiate it, and then we'd take our step. And now, all of a sudden, the M dependence is gone from the, uh, the, the, the runtime of our algorithm. Uh, at each iteration, we're only checking one constraint, the one that we know is the most violated. Now, of course, in reality, we don't just know which constraint is the most violated, but this does sort of raise the question of, well, you know, if, if we have a runtime of gamma squared M over epsilon squared, if we check every constraint, and we have a runtime of gamma squared over epsilon squared, um, <coughs> when we don't need to check every constraint, we're just given which one is the most violated, well, can we get somewhere in between these two extremes with an algorithm that doesn't assume that we have an oracle that tells us which constraint is the most violated? And that's basically what we're going to try to do here. Uh, and our answer to that question, can we find such an algorithm is yes, and we call that algorithm light touch. Um, <coughs> and basically the idea is similar to what Clarkson et al. used in their uh, Fox 2010 paper, where we're going to take this maximization over the constraints, the search for the most violated constraint, and change it into maximization over probability distribution, which is supported on the constraint indices. Uh, and you can see here that, you know, it's, it's quite clear that if we maximize over this distribution while holding everything else fixed, then ultimately the distribution will be, um, will be supported only on the, uh, the constraints that are the most violated. Um, so now we have the saddle point problem. We're going to jointly optimize over W and P by performing additive updates on the W's, the weight vectors, and multiplicative updates on the P's. And again, we're just going to alternate between these two things. So the W update is basically the same as before. Uh, we're going to draw X and Y according to D and differentiate the loss. We're going to differentiate the regularizer. And then <coughs> when we're finding the, uh, the constraint to take a step with respect to, we're going to sample a single index according to this distribution and then differentiate the, the, the corresponding constraint. You can see that because we're sampling according to P, the resulting stochastic gradient will be in expectation a stochastic a, uh, a gradient of that third term there. Uh, then we'll just sum the gradients and take a step. For the p-update, things are more complicated uh, because if we did this in a naive way, then we'd wind up with stochastic gradients with respect to p that were too high variance and ultimately our convergence rate would not be as good as we were hoping for. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to use an SVRG-like algorithm to reduce the variance of our stochastic gradients. And we're going to do that by uh, basically keeping track of an estimate of the gradient with respect to the... Um, to the constraints or through respect to distribution p at every step, and we're going to center our stochastic gradients around that. Um, now you can see just by inspection of this that if we differentiate the third term there with respect to p, then the ith component of the gradient will be gamma times the max of zero giw, that is to say gamma times the magnitude of the constraint violation. <coughs> and so we're going to say that our estimate mu has in its ith component mu i the magnitude of the constraint violation the last time we looked at it. We're just going to remember that. And every time we check a new constraint, we're going to remember it for next time. If we do this, we wind up with a an algorithm that converges in gamma squared log m over epsilon squared iterations. So it converges in log m times more iterations than the original full touch algorithm. However, it checks fewer constraints, at least if epsilon is sufficiently small. In fact, if epsilon is on the order of 1 over m squared, then light touch will perform a constant number of constraint checks at each iteration. Uh, <coughs> and so we see that we have sort of achieved what we were looking for, where we're finding an algorithm that checks uh, fewer constraints than gamma squared uh, m over epsilon squared, but more than gamma squared over epsilon squared. Uh, and please see our paper for full details. Um, we have some experiments and also a discussion of some issues that arise in practice when you're implementing this algorithm. Thank you. <coughs>